In the beginning, God's love breathed life into a world of breathtaking beauty and profound harmony. But as humanity reached for godlike power, they stumbled into disobedience, chaos, and corruption. Evil reigned. This is how the story of God begins in the Old Testament. Tension, trauma, terror. And in the face of all of this brokenness and degradation, God promises to stay in the rubble to fix the mess. He vows to start again, to create a new people, to be with them always, to forgive their wrong, and to provide them with power to become fully alive again. He promises to send help and to be their help. The story is as old as time, but it's not dated. It is a timeless epic about unwavering love. And it is not just a story from the past. It is our story now, a testament to God and his commitment to what is good, true, right, and beautiful. Prepare for a journey of faith, redemption, and the relentless pursuit of the promise-keeping God. This is the story. In the beginning, God. There's no greater start than that. In the beginning, God. He doesn't need an introduction. He just shows up on the very first page of the Bible. In Hebrew, seven words, and then you get to God. And in Hebrew, there's these things called breath marks, which kind of tells you when to breathe and when you're reading. And, and there's a breath mark right after that word God, almost as if to say, take a deep breath. So let's do that together. Let's take a deep breath. In the beginning, God, no introduction. He just shows up. And this God is greater and bigger than everything and anything. He, predate, he predates everything. And this God is about to create the heavens and the earth and everything in it. And he's about to create a glorious and beautiful and wonder and profound and harmonious. And he does it. He does it all by the power of his word. And Genesis is such an epic story because it is the origin story of all origin stories. We, we're in a culture right now in a moment where everyone wants an origin story, right? Have you noticed that like in Hollywood? They'll, they'll tell a story that we've kind of heard a lot, but they'll say, how did it start? And so very often they'll take a villain and then they'll go back to the villain's origin story and kind of tell how they become that villain. And typically when it's a villain, what they'll show is how he wasn't always bad, but, you know, society, you know, they bullied him and then the Joker started murdering people. Okay, that's cool. Um, you know, it's like, that makes sense, whatever. But like, it's an origin story of how did he become this corrupt, evil person? And if it's a hero, what they'll often show is the opposite. They'll often show how this guy didn't start off as a hero. But he had a rough start, and he had to figure out what it was to become a true hero. And it's, it's a beautiful way of just trying to say everyone has an origin. Everyone has a context that we come in. Everyone has a story. And Genesis is the origin story of all origin stories. And it says everyone, no matter where you come from or what your background is, you all find your origin ultimately in this storyline, the story of God, the story of the Bible. And it explains why there's sufferings and why our world is so broken and explains why we don't live up to our ideals. The Bible would call that sin. And, and here's the kind of big overarching reality that Genesis say, says. In a world that is so broken, with hearts that are so sinful, the good news is that God is so faithful. And that when things go bad, God doesn't run. He makes promises. He doubles down and says, I'm going to keep my promises and I can be trusted. And throughout the whole story of Genesis, that's what we see. In the beginning, God. This God made you and I and everyone in the earth. And it all started when he made the first humans, Adam and Eve. And when he makes them, he makes them in this sort of cosmic temple. The earth is described in Genesis chapter 1 as this sort of like, it's a temple space. And uh, in the ancient world, when temples were built, at the center of a temple, you would put your idol, the thing that looked like that God. And so when God creates the heavens and the earth as a sort of cosmic temple and he hangs the lights in the sky, so it's supposed to look like this temple space where God says, I want my presence and glory to fill this whole world. At the center of his creation, he puts humans. And the Hebrew word for the humans, uh, it's this, it describes humans as being made in God's image. That Hebrew word there is the same word that the Hebrew will use for idol. The idea is that you and I are the representatives of what God is supposed to look like. That every human being, no matter if you're religious or not, if you're good or bad, or, or what your background is, 
you were made with a, a, a special capacity to image forth God into the world. That you have dignity and worth and value. And it's not because of what you do, but because of who made you and whose fingerprints are all over you. You matter because God made you. And not only are you made in God's image, the Bible says, uh, let's make man in our image, God says, Genesis 1.26. And then he says, God bless them. God wants to bless you. He created you to be a blessing and he blesses the first Adam and Eve, right? The first humans. And God says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue and have dominion. That is the language of kingship and and authority and monarchy. God has made humans to be kings and queens who fill the earth with God's glory. That was the purpose of humanity, We were made to reign with God, to be his co-workers. See, he creates the heavens and the earth, and he places the first human beings on this garden, and it's actually a garden on a mountainside. You know that because there's a river flowing through it. And so there's like this sense of like this garden mountain, the first king and queen of creation are there, and their job is to have lots of babies, fill the whole world with babies and children that look like God and act like him, and make sure the rest of the world looks like this garden, cultivated and beautiful and well-kept. That's awesome, right? That was the call of humanity. That was the dignity we were installed in. And God says, I made you in my likeness. I made you in my likeness. Now, um, here's why it's hard to see your kids rebel. Because our kids are made in our likeness. You you ever ever see that? Like, let's say your kid is acting uh, really particularly difficult, right? And uh, you just want to disown them. You can't. Cause they got your ears. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, or is that just me, right? So like I show up on Wednesday to pick up my son and the teacher's like, ooh, we got to talk. I'm like, he's assaulting kids, isn't he? Yes, he is. And he's three, right? And so um, now we got to talk about aggression and keeping your hands to yourself. And I have no idea where you got that from. Um, but you know, the, the child you make is made in your image and likeness. They look like you. That's how God made us to look like him. And when our children go wrong, it is a poor reflection on us. Well, the Bible has a story about how we went wrong and it it reflected poorly on God, not in that he made us that way, but rather in that we have chosen to go a different way than who he is. And that's immediately what happens to this king and queen. These, These people who were made to fill the earth with God's glory, immediately, as it seems, page three in the Bible, they go their own way. So in this garden, you guys know the story probably, there's a tree, and this tree is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And here's what you got to know about this tree. Um, That idea is, uh, what God says is, you can eat of every tree, but not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The idea here isn't that the humans aren't supposed to grow and mature and figure out what good and evil is. The, The idea is that they're not supposed to grab the tree to figure it out on their own terms. So what God does is he gives them a choice. God puts this tree in the garden as if to say, are you going to trust me and my words in my way, or are you going to try to take a shortcut and figure it out on your own? And so that is the human choice. In fact, that's the choice before us today. Every one of us has a question before us. Will we figure things out and define reality on our own terms, or will we be the kings and queens God created us to be and follow him on his terms? Who will define the reality that you're in? What story do you belong to? And and who is truly God and Lord of your life? That is the question of the Bible right from the start. And of course, we know that Eve reaches out because she sees that it's good for food. And she desires it. And so she grabs them and she eats it, right? That's why women have a problem figuring out where they want to eat now. First decision was bad, all right? Now they're just kind of, you know, it's in their blood. Um, But she eats and Adam grabs and eats with her and so you get this picture that Adam's just passively watching his wife talk to Satan because Satan's the one who put him up to it he comes in as a snake and says you should eat this God don't really care about you he's not looking out for you gets Eve to doubt God's word she eats Adam passively follows his wife and the whole world now begins to fragment and fall apart so if scene one we could call kings and queens scene two we should call naked and ashamed. Because though God's people were made to be naked and unashamed, secure in who they are and in what they're called to do, now Adam and Eve are filled with shame and hiding and blame shifting and fear and insecurity. I mean, you see it right away. God goes looking for Adam. Adam, where are you? 
Adam says, I'm hiding because I was scared because I realized I was naked. Well, who told you? Well, we did the thing that you said we shouldn't do. And instantly God says, why would you do that? And, and Adam instantly goes, well, it was the woman that you gave me. All right, so there's like the blame shift. Did you see subtly? He's like, well, it's her fault and also your fault. She's, she's defective, all right? Blame shifting, not owning, not taking responsibility, says God, you did something wrong or she did something wrong, but I'm in the clear. Then God goes to Eve and says, what did you do? She says, Satan made me do it. Yeah, the snake, you know, there's a snake that told me and I thought it was a good idea. And, and the, the, the snake had no legs to stand on. So he just, you know, falls apart, right? He just, yeah, it's me. And so instantly you get this idea of, of, of them blame shifting. There's defensiveness, they're hiding, they're ashamed, they're insecure. Here's the point. That's where sin always leads. It always leads to a death of your security, to a death of your spiritual life, to a death of your relationship to God and others. You always begin to erect barriers and feel unsafe when sin is in the conversation. Some of you, maybe you grew up in the church and then there was a season where you walked and did things your own way and then you found out the hard way that, yep, it is ugly out there, all right? And now you're back. Welcome to Gateway, right? Um, legit, that's what happens. People kind of go through life, and they maybe have heard it, and they'll come back home, they'll start going back to church because they realize, like, yeah, this is tough. That's a very common story because they're finding out what the first humans found out, which is God's way is the best way, and to choose life on your own terms is actually to invite death, shame, fear, and guilt. And suddenly a war begins, and the war is now between uh, good and evil, uh, Satan and his children, and God and his children. And here's how the judgment goes. In Genesis chapter 3, God says, I will make a war between you and the woman. I'll put enmity between your children and her children. And, and, and you're going to bruise the head of, this, of one of her children. I'm sorry, he's going to bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So here's the idea. God says, one day, there's going to come a child of a woman who's going to stomp out evil. And in doing that, you're going to bite his heel. It's metaphorical. It's imagery, right? And the idea is that the one who comes to stomp out evil will be wounded, but he will also be victorious. So right away, as soon as sin enters the conversation, God's heart is to make a promise to send a wounded warrior who will rescue God's people at great cost and consequence to himself. And the promise is that God will send a champion. And he looks at the woman and says, now I'm going to multiply your pain in childbearing. And he looks at, the, at Adam and says, because you listened to the voice of your wife and you did it what I said you shouldn't do, you're now going to be cursed as you work that ground. In pain you shall eat all of the days of your life. Thorns and thistles will come up from the ground now. And, and so by the sweat of your face you will eat bread now. And one day you will return to that ground. You are dust. You're going to return to dust. Here's the idea. Now on every front of our human existence, we're at war. Spiritual war between us and Satan. A marital war between us and our wives. We're going to see that there's going to be family breakdown between brothers and, and sisters. We're going to see that there's going to be work-life breakdown. And that's all because we are now under what the Bible calls the curse or judgment. That the world has been deeply demonized and wounded because of sin. Right? And this is why life is hard. Okay? God says now what you were made to do, fruitful and multiply, that's going to be difficult. Having kids is painful. Amen, ladies? Right? It's painful. And, 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 and going to work and then having work work against you is exhausting. There's always another email. Okay, there's always another task to be done. There's always a complaint. There's always someone ranting about you on Facebook, all right? Rants and raves is hot, okay? Someone's always disappointed in the work and quality of level of work you're doing. Why? Because you're working and work is working against you and there's always weeds to pull out now. That is life post-Genesis 3. That's the, the, the cost of our sin we have a, a world that is cursed and broken. But we also have a promise. And the promise is that there's a chosen child who will come to deliver the world and who will, will crush this evil rebellion. And he will cover the nakedness of these people. That's what God does next. He gets some clothes and he covers them in their nakedness. 
close in the Old Testament is, um, it's a metaphor for inheritance. Remember the story of the prodigal son, if you know that story? It's about a guy who takes his dad's inheritance, spends it like crazy, comes back after parting it up, and basically says, just make me one of your slaves. What's the first thing dad does? Hugs him, kisses him, puts a ring on his finger, and gets a coat. And the coat is, you get back into the family inheritance. You're, you're just bought right back in. And so when God closed Adam and Eve, what is he saying to them? You're right back into the inheritance. You, you couldn't fight your way out of my family because I love you that much. That's how committed God is. He gives them their share once again as children. Scene one, kings and queens. Scene two, naked and ashamed. And then what we have is scene three, the fallout. The fallout. And there's even a hope of maybe this is the fresh start, but you see it instantly, right? So Adam and Eve, they have children, and, and their children are Cain and Abel. And if you know that story, uh, it's the story of how Cain murders Abel because he gets jealous. Okay, any of you have children? A any of you see the applications here, okay? Yeah, kids fight. Like, that's just normal. Have you ever seen, like, two siblings walking in a hallway beside each other? What happens? One gets assaulted for no reason. The boom, what, what happened? He was existing near me, you know? And I'm not touching you. My kids do this every day, all right? And we're renaming them Cain and Abelina um, because, like, that's just the MO now, right? Um, and so violence fills this whole family right away. Cain kills Abel, and then Cain builds a city, and cities become symbolic in the Old Testament as a way of rejecting God's provision and trying to fortify and protect themselves and provide for themselves. Like, like this guy named Lamech, for instance, he starts collecting wives. He has two wives, and he, he writes a song about how he's more violent than his uh, 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 grandpa, Cain. Yeah, I'm, violent, I'm more violent than him, and he builds, he, he's like a builder of the city. And, and all of a sudden, cities start to pop up all around the ancient world, and they are filled with people who trust in themselves and not in God. And it's true even to this day. People move to the city as a way of saying, I don't need you, God. I can take care of myself. And, and cities in the Bible story become a place where people go to, to try to get away from God. And you start to see the violence is picking up all around. And, and no matter what happens, it, it, God is trying to pursue his people. But there's violence growing and growing and growing to the point where Genesis chapter 6 tells us, honestly, it's kind of a, grow, it's kind of a, a really mysterious story. But there's what's called the sons of daughter, the sons of Eve. and uh, I'm sorry, the sons of God and the daughters of Eve. And... Um, it's kind of ambiguous because sons of God can just mean like regular humans or some people think it means angels. And basically what they do is they go and they sleep with some girls and suddenly that race becomes really violent and evil. And so you get this idea that there's something demonic and nefarious going on and there's something really evil because all of the people who come from this family line, they become these great warriors of renown. And basically they're violent they're demonic in their nature. Their origin is filled with hate. And there's perversion in every city that they build. Like right away they start building like Babylon and Assyria and Canaan. And if you know the story of the Bible, you're like, oop, bad, bad, bad. Right? That's like all bad, those cities. And these men are filled with violence and vicious and nasty and perverted. And the Bible says that God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great on earth. And that every intention and thought of his heart was only evil continually. And God regretted that he made humans. And he grieved him that they were this way. So God said, I'm going to wipe out every man from the face of the earth. Every animal, every creeping thing, the birds of the heavens. I'm so sorry that I even made them. But one, Noah, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So Genesis 6 says that God is going to unleash a judgment on the earth. This is the story of Noah's Ark. If you've heard this story, this is it. It starts because of perversion and violence and God's judgment being poured out. God opens up the windows of heaven and unleashes floods on the earth to literally wipe clean the earth because he says, we got to start over, man. This, is, this evil's picking up too quick and it's happening too fast at every level. We need to start again. And God wants to stop the fallout and start a fresh start. And so he chooses a man named Noah to do it. Noah's name means rest. It's almost like God is saying, you know, 
after I created the heavens and the earth in six days, the seventh day was all about rest. And, and I want to give you guys that rest. Don't you want that? Let's start again. But in order for the world to start again, it has to go through this judgment of the whole world flooding. And, and here's the thing about this story. It is, a wor- it is a story of God's absolute wrath and judgment coming down on evil. And, and I know that stories like this have been sanitized because of VBS and kids' ministry. But it's a pretty gnarly story, right? Um, a lot of people do this. Like, did you know, for example, that uh, Cinderella, her stepsisters, they end up having to mutilate their feet because they don't fit in that glass slipper? And then their eyes are pecked out? Yeah, you didn't read that in your book, right? Or, or like, for example, uh, The Little Mermaid. She actually doesn't lose her voice in the original story. She actually has to cut out her tongue, okay? And that's kind of how the story goes. And our version is very different. Okay, Sleeping Beauty, it wasn't charmed that got that prince that kiss, right? Like, it's a very different story when you read it originally. And what we've done is we've taken the story and we've sanitized it and presented it to our kids. We do it with Bible stories. Like, like we go to our nurseries and we paint Noah's Ark all over. And you have, like, a giraffe giving, like, a hippo, uh, like, you know, piggyback ride and, you know, tiger smiling. And then, like, but I'm like, where are the dead bodies at, man? This ain't biblical, right? Like, like let's get those bodies floating. If we're going to be biblical, let's go for it, bro, you know? But, but we've sanitized. And so what we don't see is a God who's incredibly grieved and angry because humans have begun to um, destroy the world, and they no longer are acting like the kings and queens that he made them to be. They are now living their own way. So God rains his judgment down on earth. 40 days, 40 nights, raining, 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 and the only ones who survive is Noah and his family because they get onto this ark that God has told them to build. And as they get into this ark, it's like God is uncreating the world, unleashing the chaos and darkness of the waters. Genesis 8.1 says, After 40 days, God remembered Noah and all the animals in that ark. And God made another wind, a spirit, to blow over the earth, and the waters stopped. God remembers his promise. God says, let's start again. And let's start again. No matter how many times people sin, God says, let's start again. Let, wipe it clean. Let's start again. Wipe it clean. Let's start again. Wipe it clean. Let's start again. This is the story of the whole Bible and the story of every one of our lives and every family and every culture and every people. God says, let's start again. And Noah looks like maybe he's the answer. Maybe he's the one who will bring rest. Maybe he is the one who will bring God's rescue into this world. Maybe he is the promised child who will bring clarity and hope. But as soon as that boat docks on a mountain... First thing Noah does is he's kind of happy and gives God worship. But then he says he became a man of the soil, becomes a farmer. And he goes and he plants a vineyard. And after planting this vineyard, he drinks the wine and he becomes drunk and uncovered in his tent. Where are we? We're back in Genesis 3, naked and ashamed in a garden again. God said, let's start again. And next thing you know, this dude's partying all night, drunk and naked, okay? Um, This is the first hillbilly. I'm just kidding. Um, You know, it's like he's drunk and naked again already. And we're back in the garden. We're back in shame. We're back naked. This is not the hope that we had hoped for. In fact, one of his children, the Bible says, goes in and sees him naked and does something kind of nefarious and perverted. We're not exactly sure, but we know that when Noah sobers up, he's very angry at his child. Two of them cover him. One of them does something that Noah looks at him and curses him. Says, you and all your kids are cursed. And that family line, through that child who did that evil thing, that becomes the family line of, again, Cana, Assyria, Babylon, all the wicked, evil cities that we see throughout the rest of the Bible story. Right there, that's their origin a perverted son who mocks and dishonors his father. And the idea is God continues to remember his promise even when we forget obedience. God continues to pursue his kids even when his kids really, really misbehave. 
And this child of Noah Ham, he's so bad. His kids are the ones that build the Tower of Babel. You guys remember the Tower of Babel? Which, by the way, actually is supposed to be called the Tower of Babylon. Same, same idea. That's the Tower of Babylon being built. And they say, let's make a great name for ourselves. Forget God's call in our life. Let's settle down and build a, a tower to the heavens. We're proud of what we've done. Let's do it. They use the technology of brick and mortar to try to reach the heavens and make themselves famous. And God goes and confuses them and spreads them throughout the earth. And then God says, you know what? I'm not done with my creation. Let's start again. God says, I do want to give you a name, but it's not going to be a name based on your own work, but based on my gracious gift. And so one of Noah's children, their name is Shem, which means name. And this is God's way of already saying, I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to give you a clean start. We're going to start again. Let's start again. I mean, it's unbelievable how many startups God has already given humanity. He just keeps going, okay, that's fine. Let's start again. Okay, you made a mess. Let's try it again. Okay, another screw up. Let's go again. Let's go again. Let's go again. Let's go again. And again, I know that many of us, after when we first heard these stories, we were told, be like Noah. Don't get drunk and be naked. Okay, let's just start there. Like, like Noah is a great example of faith to some degree. He made the ark. He got in it. Praise God. But in other ways, Noah is a flawed, sinful man like you and I. And the point of that story isn't let's be like Noah. It's let's remember how kind God is to sinners and how he can reach and transform the worst of them like Noah. And God says, let me give Noah and his family a new name. And that's the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And then we get to one of the biggest shifts in the whole book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. And here's a major character of the whole story of the whole Bible and especially Genesis, we get a promise from a man named Abraham. And the promise of Abraham is go. You got to leave everything behind. Leave your family, leave everything you know, and go. And I'm going to give you children. I'm going to give you a new land to set up a home. And I'm going to give you a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. Go. And and here's what God's saying. I'm going to give you the name that you want. Look at me, church. Don't you want a clean name? Don't you want a name that people when they say it it's held in esteem the only way to get it is not by through your works but by God's gracious gift to you that he would forgive you and then fill you with power to live honorably but here is scene four now it's the story of a faithful father and Abraham's not that faithful father in fact Abraham is more often than not faithless God tells him go and I'm going to bless you and give you children God says look up at the night and Abraham looks up he says how many stars are there and Abraham's like I can't count them he's like that's how many kids you're going to have and God says look down you're in a desert and he looks around and he says look how much sand there is he says that's how many kids are going to be part of your family Abraham and he's given this great promise but you know what I don't know if I would have chosen Abraham if I'm being honest if I was God because Abraham does not look qualified To begin with, Joshua 24 tells us he was an idolater, so he worships false gods. He doesn't worship God. He worships other gods. Number two, uh, Abraham is a coward. We know this because pretty soon he's going to go into the city. And when he goes into the city, uh, a king wants to date his wife, but he's nervous about that. So instead of saying, hey, man, that's my girl she's spoken for, he looks at at his wife and says, tell him you're my sister. She's like, okay, this is weird. Um, And he does. And so then the king tries to pick up on his wife. And that night, the king has this nightmare. I'm going to judge you for taking another man's wife. And the king's like, wait, I didn't know she was married. So then the king has to come back to Abraham and be like, what are you doing, bro? You told me that was your sister. And she's actually your wife. What are you, from Ohio? I'm just kidding. He doesn't say that. Um, He he says, what are you doing, dude? Like, what are you doing, bro? And Abraham's like... You're right. She kind of is my sister because, you know, and it's like, just like so weird. And some of you are like, oh, that's gross. That's disgusting. He does it again. He does it twice. Two strikes and you're out with that one, right? He goes into another city. Same exact thing. He's a coward. He's faithless. He's from Ohio. And then God says, I'm going to give you lots of kids. I'm going to give you lots of kids. And when he hears it, he laughs at the promise. says, I'm too old. I'm a grandpa. And, and then his wife hears it and she laughs and says, I'm too old. I haven't been able to have kids forever. And no, we're not, it's not going to happen. He's 75 when he hears this. Imagine a 75-year-old dad, right? That's not gonna, he's laughable at the promise. 
And so not only is he not only is he worship the wrong God, not only is he a coward, not only is he laughing at God's promise, but he, here's the, the worst part of all, he's impatient. He gets God's promise and says, okay, I believe. I'm just going to agree with your promise, God. Because the Bible does say, to be fair, that Abraham at some point says, okay, I believe. And the Bible says it's counting him as righteousness. So he does have some faith. He is the father of faith in some sense. But even then, it starts and stops with this faith, right? So for example, um, he, it, time has been going on, and uh, they've been trying, and uh, granny and grandma, uh, you know, granny and grandpa cannot have babies, okay? And so at some point, his wife goes, maybe you should try sleeping with my servant. Like, my, she works for me, try her. So she offers him a side chick, and Abraham goes, hmm, that sounds like it's from God. And so he goes and gets a girlfriend, pregnant, and then what do you think happens? Yeah, that ends exactly the way you think it's going to happen. If your wife suggests an open marriage, not a good idea, okay? But that's what Abraham, okay, let's try it. He gets her pregnant, and then the wife starts getting jealous. There's literally a story, I don't got time, but I think it's so funny, because there's literally a story where Sarah, who just gave her coworker to, or not coworker, but her employee, to Abraham to sleep with, she gets pregnant. She's still feeling bad about, oh, I can't have babies. So the Bible says, she looked on her slave with contempt. Then she goes to Abraham and says, she's looking at me funny. That don't sound like any girls I know. Um, It's like she's looking at her bad, saying, she's looking at me bad, Abraham. Do something about it. And it's like projecting. Um, But you have this like obvious like jealousy, and that starts to tear up the family, and they're fighting, and there's drama, and it's awkward. There's Father Abraham. Yeah, had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, right? There he is. He's obviously flawed. But you know what? When God makes a promise, it doesn't matter how flawed the person who received that promise is. What matters is how faithful the God who made the promise is. That's the point, church. God has made a promise. He changes his name. He changes his destiny. He gives him this ceremony called circumcision where he says, this is going to be a new sign that I'm going to do what I promised I've done, I'm going to do for you. Abraham says, I agree. Sign me up. I trust. And God says, that's all you need. All you need today is to fall into God's promises and let him do the rest. You do not need to be qualified to have a relationship with God. In fact, that's the one thing that will keep you away from a relationship with God. If you want to have a relationship with God today, just say, I agree, I can't do it. Could you help me, God? That is the qualification. And that is what what Abraham does. He says, okay, God, I agree. And over the course of his life, suddenly we see him becoming a man of faith. So that by the end of his life, he is a faithful man. He does trust God. He is godly. But it didn't start that way. So a lot of times we judge people who've been walking in the faith a long time and say, why can't I be like them? Well, it took them a long time to get there. That's Abraham. Abraham, it took him time. It's like an iceberg where, where the top is melting. So it feels like, you know, that you're not actually dealing with the iceberg. But the truth is, there's all of this stuff underneath the water that's just rising up. It's just taking time. To melt away the sin in your heart takes time. And Abraham is this way because by the end of Abraham's life, he finally has this child, and the promised child is his, and God says, now give me the child, which would be heartbreaking because this was all of his hope and dreams. But Abraham at this point has become faithful. So he says, God, you've given me this gift. I will worship you and not the gift. And he obeys God and goes to sacrifice his son. Could you imagine the wrestling of this old man who thinks, man, this is it. Like God promised me stars and sand and the one little piece of grain of sand I have, I have to give it back to him? I got to give my grain of sand back to him? He does. Here's what one author says about Abraham. God let the suffering old man go through with it up to the point where he knew there would be no retreat. And then God stopped him from laying a hand upon his boy. To that wondering patriarch, he now says in effect, It's all right, Abraham. I never intended that you should actually kill the lad. I only wanted to remove him from the temple of your heart so that I can reign unchallenged there. I wanted to correct the perversion that existed in your love. At the end, his name is A.W. Tozer. He offers this prayer that I would like to offer you now to consider praying. He says, Father, I want to know you, but my cowardly heart fears to give up its toys. 
I cannot part with the toys without inward bleeding. And I'm not even trying to hide from you the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please root out from my heart all the things which I've so cherished for so long, they've become a part of my very living self, so that you can enter inside my heart without rival. Then your feet will be glorious there. Then my heart will have no need of the sun to shine in it. For you will be the light of my heart, and there will be no night within. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what he says, God, just take seat in my heart. This is the process that Abraham must go through, and he becomes a faithful father. Scene four. Scene five, we can describe from Genesis pretty much 22 on through basically the end. We can call scene five the broken family. And what we find is that dad's sins get passed on to his kids. Remember I told you that Abraham said, you know, that's my sister, not my wife? Well, his son ends up doing the same thing. His son goes into a territory, gets scared, says, actually, that's my sister, not my wife, probably because he heard the stories and saw dad do it. And here's what you get from scene five. You get the story of a broken family. And here's the idea, church, listen. If you don't transform your story, you will transmit it. Your sin, your suffering, and your story is passed down. Some people call this generational curses. Some of you are wondering, why is my life so hard right now? And that's because grandpa's inside of you. And he didn't deal with stuff, and maybe dad didn't deal with stuff, and now you're dealing with stuff that they never actually worked on and worked through. Because you're going to see cycles happen. Things that grandpa dealt with, now grandkid is dealing with. You're like, is there a connection? Yes, the connection is there was not a person to say, enough is enough. I'm gonna worship God, be faithful, go to church, you know, raise my kids up in the faith. There was not a decision to make a break from their past, and so because of that, they remain in the old way. If you don't transform it, you transmit it. The sins that we see in Genesis are passed on to their kids and their kids' kids and their kids. It's clear as day. Lying. Abraham's a liar. Isaac, his son, is a liar. Jacob, his name literally means liar. Like if you name your grandkid liar, you're just kind of, you know, letting the cat out of the bag there. We struggle with this in our family. All of Joseph's brothers who put him in jail and sell him are liars. That's generational sin. Jealousy, conflict, favoritism. You see it all throughout their story. Sarah fights with Hagar, the, the slave who sleeps with Abraham. Jacob and Esau are fighting. Joseph and the rest of his brothers are fighting. That's all passed down. Jealousy, conflict, favoritism. It didn't start with you and your family. It's generational. Infidelity. Abraham sleeps with Hagar. Jacob sleeps with four women. You see other messy brokenness happening. You see that there's division, there's fighting, that this blended family is messy and there's generational trauma. And so what I'm trying to say to you, church, is you might be wondering right now, can God use someone with as broken as a family as I have? And the answer is, read Genesis. Those are the only kinds of families he has. And now you might be wondering, well, can I be any different than my mom or dad? Because mom got divorced and, and dad was a drunk. And so am I doomed to go into alcoholism? And am I doomed to have this terrible marriage? And am I doomed to be emotionally gutted because that's how I got raised? And the answer is you can actually, by God's grace, say, I'm going to be different. And my kids are going to be different. And my grandkids will be blessed by my faithfulness. That's how it changes. It doesn't start where all of a sudden you think, oh, you know, this is out of nowhere. No, it's in a context that you came from somebody. And they never dealt, or maybe they did as best they could. But what they handed you, your job is to take it, and by God's grace, take it further. Now, some of you, you know what I'm talking about, because you look and say, I, I had a great dad. I had a great mom. I had a great grandpa. You know what? Someone decided at some point enough was enough, and they were going to deal with the sins of their family, and they changed the directory. Thank God for them. If you come from a legacy of, of God-given holiness, of people who raise their family to love Jesus, serve their communities, love their kids. Not perfect, no one's perfect, but they did pretty good. You should fall on your face at some point today and say, thank you, Jesus, that I come from this storyline. Because for many of us, we didn't come from that storyline. We're the first in a long line of people with sins that need to be dealt with. 
To varying degrees, all of us has various stories of pain and trauma and brokenness. The point is God can use you if you would decide to be the first in a new line. That's why it's so hard, by the way. You're like, man, why is it so tough to learn these things? Because no one taught you. What they taught you was the opposite. They taught you and they passed on to you things that were not healthy and godly. And now you're like, man, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it's because you're dealing with generations of sin that have been given to you. Generations of suffering that hasn't been processed and dealt with well. And Genesis is the invitation to say enough is enough. Suffering is passed on. Many women in the book of Genesis suffer with infertility. Some of you know the sting of infertility all too familiarly. It's difficult. Genesis is for you. Sexual abuse, all throughout Genesis. All throughout it. Lot, one of the the people in this story, his daughters get him drunk and then sleep with him. Two of them. Um, Jacob has a daughter named Dinah who's raped. And then when the brothers find out that that happened, they go and they, uh, they, they kill her. They, 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 sorry, they kill the, the guys who did it. And then the dad, instead of like being like, hey, you dealt justice for our, you know, took care of our, my daughter, the dad basically says, what are you doing? You're making it hard for me in the community. And you're like, oh my gosh. This dude's obsessed with this reputation that he forgot that his daughter was treated poorly and doesn't even care. And the brothers go, oh, you want me to allow them to treat my sister like she's a whore? That's what it says. And like, (laughs) the idea that the Bible is like for good people who have it all together, I'm just like, have you ever read it? I don't think so. We got infertility, we got rape, we got abuse, we got incest. I mean, we have all of these real, everyday life issues, and that's God's people. We're not talking about the pagan nations right now. I'm not judging Canaan, right? I'm not judging Babylon and Assyria. I'm talking about Israel. Judgment starts with the house of the Lord. And all of these stories are supposed to awaken us to the fact that the Bible is not a series of moral stories about you being good enough that can inspire you to live a godly life. No, you and I are not the hero of the Bible. Jesus is the hero of the Bible. Israel is not the hero of the Bible. Jesus, neither your family nor your failures are finally definitive because the faithfulness of God, the Father, has shown up in sending his son Jesus to be what you and I could not be. And so now we're not definitive defined by our father's failures we're defined by our heavenly father's success we're not defined by our family's passed down sins we are defined by the power of God in giving us a new legacy because of what Jesus and his spirit are doing in us here's the point when I am that's the name of God when I am says I will he always does period When I am says, I will, he always does. God can be trusted. He is not like the fathers and mothers that we came from. He's faithful and kind and good and perfect. And his faithfulness outweighs your failures or your family's failures. And his salvation is your new story. That's all of scene five. And if you want to get like specific scene six, we would call it wrestling with God. It's the story of Jacob. Jacob's name means deceiver, liar, supplanter. And his whole life is filled with competition, deceiving and running from God, looking for love in all the wrong places. This guy is so desperate to be number one and he never can be. His dad doesn't really love him the way he loves his older brother. He's a twin. And his dad loves Esau, not Jacob. Jacob's always wounded by, I'm just second best. I'm not loved. His mom really loves him. He's a mama's boy, but dad's just, and so you see just Jacob running, looking for love, looking for love, looking for love. And you know what Jacob does? He steals his brother's position in the family. He literally tricks his dad, who's blind and dying, into blessing him as if he were the oldest. It's like he's so desperate for his dad's validation and approval. And then when he doesn't get it, he has to run from the family and he runs and and finally he finds some distant relatives where he can kind of set up camp with and he looks and he finds this girl who he's just, man, he's in love with. But you know what you find in, in his story? This guy is still looking for love. He's still looking for validation. He's still looking for one who will look at him and say, I see you and I love you. And so what he's about to do is try to find that through a relationship. 
It's not going to go well for him. Some of you are the same way. You're still not convinced the Father's enough for you, so you're looking forward in sex, in romance, and relationships. Some of you were doing that, and then you got married, and now you're in that disappointing stage. Where you're like, man, I thought this was going to be it. That's Jacob's story. And Jacob basically goes to this man and says, I want to marry your daughter. I'll work seven years for her, which is a crazy amount of that time to work for a daughter, but he does. And then after that, uh, at the wedding party, he says, I'm ready to have sex with her. He literally goes up and says, that brash to the father-in-law. Super weird in the Hebrew. And Laban's like, okay. And then next thing you know, he's been partying all night. It's dark. He goes into the tent, sleeps with her. And in the morning he wakes up and it's the wrong sister. It's the older sister, not the younger sister. He went in looking for Rachel in the morning. It's Leah. It's always Leah in the morning. It's always disappointing in the morning. Really. You have your heart set. This is going to be it. And then you have to wake up and deal with what you've done. And he, he, he goes and says, you lied to me, Laban. And Laban says, I don't know how you guys do it in your country, but in our country, the older never goes behind the younger. Stabs Jacob because that's his whole life story. Fine, what do I got to do to get another one? Give me your daughter. Seven more years. He works seven more years. And now he has two wives. Like if, if your solution to your problems in life is to get another wife, you need some therapy. Jacob's like, give me another one. Okay. Well, now these two women start to compete. They start to fight for his attention and approval. And they start to have babies. Because maybe if I can have enough babies, he'll finally love me. And so, so Leah, the, the, the one who's older and not as attractive in the story, uh, by the way, names matter in the story of the Bible, right? Like Leah, her name means like cow. Okay, that's what they named her. Like your name is cow, you know? And then Rachel, her name is little lamb. <laughs> She's easy on the eyes is what they say about her. And then cow, come here. Come, just be nice to little lamb. I mean, that's the storyline, right? So, so Leah, cow, is like, I just want love. I just want to, I'm just trying my best to find love. And so maybe if I can have kids, he'll actually see me and not my sister who's always been better and more beautiful than me. And so she starts having babies and names matter. Names matter. They matter today. That's why we wear designer clothes, right? We wear Louis Vuitton because it matters. We wear Prada because it matters. Ralph Lauren. If you're broke like me, JC Penai, because it matters. You know what I'm saying? All right? If I'm feeling myself, Dillard's, you know? Um, but, but names matter. And so names in the story of the Bible matter. And so as soon as she starts having these kids, every name tells a story. First kid that Leah has, Reuben. And Reuben's name means, look, a son. Almost like she's crying out and saying, will you see me now, Jacob? But he doesn't. So she has another son, Simeon. And his name means, have you, uh, he has heard me. Do you hear me now, Jacob? And then she has another son named Levi, which means, connected, attached. Will you be attached to me now, Jacob? And then she has another son where she finally realizes, you know what, this ain't going to do it. It's called, his name is Judah, and Judah means just thank you, God. Well, now the other sister gets jealous, and she starts having babies. And she has uh, two kids. The second one is named Naphtali, which means I win. Literally, that's what she names her kid. <laughs> so then Leah's like, mm-mm. So then Leah gets her servants and says, why don't you sleep with them? So she sleeps with one of the servants, and, and, and she has two kids, Leah's servant, Asher and Gad. Gad sounds like an Italian blaspheming, but what it really means, oh my Gad, right? It's not that. Um, it means good fortune. And, and, and it's like, you're blessing me still, God. And then Leah has two more kids, Issachar and Zebul, which means God has paid for me doing the right thing and gift. And then Rachel finally says, you know what? I'm going to have my own kids. And she has two more kids, Benjamin and Joseph. Joseph means beautiful, intelligent Mexican man. Um, it's, it's, it's in the Hebrew. Um, and <laughs> you guys don't know Hebrew. I do. Trust me. Um, trust me. It also means God has taken away my shame. <laughs> and and what it, what, the point is, you see these two sisters just, will you see me? Do you love me? Do you? And, and it's never enough. It's never enough. Those 12 names that I just mentioned, welcome to the 12 tribes of Israel. That's Israel. That's their origin story. That's how it all got started. Then the story of Genesis goes and tells the story of one of the sons, Joseph. And this is now the final scene of, jo of Genesis about how the good God can be trusted. And the story goes that Joseph, everyone's jealous of him because he has dreams of greatness that have been given by God. 
and he's eventually sold into slavery, left for dead, sold into slavery. When he's a slave at this master's house, he's in Egypt, he's lied against, falsely accused of rape, it ends him in jail. And in jail, he does all these good things for those around him and even helps them win their freedom and he's forgotten. And then one day the king has this terrible nightmare that everything's gonna go bad and Joseph's able to interpret it and then Joseph is raised to the right hand position of the king. And what Joseph foresaw through this king's dream is that the whole world's gonna be broken and falling apart, but if you prepare now and ration, you can prepare for that. And that is actually what catapults Egypt as the world power of the whole world in that time. That's where Exodus starts. We'll talk about that next week. But the idea now is Joseph is the right-hand king of the whole world, and then his brothers, who had betrayed him and done all this bad stuff to him and told, they basically told their dad that he had died earlier, even though they made up the whole story. They have to go and confront Joseph. They find out it's Joseph. They think Joseph's going to be really mad at them. And you know what Joseph says to them? Joseph, no, 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 man. He cries, actually, when he hears about it. And he says, look, you guys intended to hurt me, but God meant it for good. That's like the story of the whole book of Genesis. You intended for bad, and God meant it for good, that many would be kept alive and saved. He says, I'm not in God's place to judge you. That's between you and God. You meant it for bad. But God meant it for good. God can be trusted. God can be trusted with our brokenness and our failures and our family's failures and our stories. God can be trusted. And the clearest picture of God's trustworthiness is not in any story I've told you, but it's in the story that these stories all ultimately find their climax and point in. That's Jesus. See, Jesus is the final, ultimate storyline of this whole book. He is the greater Adam who doesn't disobey but obeys in a garden. And he takes onto his head thorns and thistles as a crown, taking Adam's judgment and sin onto himself. Jesus is the greater new Adam. Jesus is the greater Abel. When he is crucified, his blood is poured out onto the ground. It doesn't cry out justice and vengeance for his brothers. It cries out forgiveness and justification. Jesus is the greater Abel. Jesus is the greater Noah who will bring true rest and a true humanity. He is the greater ark that if you get into him, you will find safety for your life. Jesus is the greater Shem who is going to give you a new name and a new hope. Jesus is the greater Abraham who leaves his home, who leaves his country, and goes and finds a new family with eternal blessing. Jesus is the greater Isaac. He, he's not almost sacrificed. He's actually sacrificed by his father. Jesus is the greater Jacob, but he has perfect integrity and he loves the ugly bride before him. And Jesus is the greater Joseph. Listen to the story of Joseph, the favored son of the father who had dreamed that he was destined for greatness and yet his brothers were jealous and despised him for it sent on a mission to look for them. He was not welcomed. Rather, he was plotted against, betrayed, and left for dead in a pit. His robe of status ripped from him, dipped in blood, and shown to the father that he had truly died. And then he was sold for silver, tempted in every way, falsely accused, and completely pure through it all, knowing God was with him. And after doing right continually, he is forgotten by those he helped to set free. Through all of the humiliation, he's faithful. And so God exalts him to the right hand of the king. And having been rejected by his Jewish brothers, he is given a Gentile bride. And the nations are directed to come to him for rescue, food, and life. Brothers, sisters, that's the story of Jesus. The whole book is about Jesus. And how he is faithful when we are faithless. So if you feel like, My story is in a moment where I'm not sure God can redeem and rescue and save. That's what he does. He's not an amateur. He's a professional. So can we trust God to give us a new start? Can we trust God to be our new Genesis? In the beginning, God. He created the heavens and the earth. And then he created the church. You are his people. You are the beginning of God making all things new through Jesus Christ. That's what we are.